My definition of addiction is something that you can't stop, right? And most people who struggle from addictions are trying to regulate and alter their internal state. Now you and I have been hypnotized and conditioned into believing that change happens outside of us. People are looking for something outside of them to change their internal state. It's kind of a Newtonian principle. You wait for your wealth to come to feel abundant. You wait for your healing to occur to feel wholeness. You wait for your success to show up so you feel empowered. You wait for your new relationship to show up to feel love. You're, you're waiting for the event outside of you to happen to change how you feel inside of you. That's cause and effect. And we're conditioned based on consumerism and marketing and programming that that's the way it works. To, to, to get something to relieve yourself. And, uh, and the problem with that is that people begin to confuse true happiness with pleasure and they're not the same thing so people who have addictions like that typically have had uh, some very difficult past experiences that have branded them emotionally and they just don't know how to change they just don't know and they're just looking for some relief inside of them so that they can make that feeling go away so we can become distracted by our external environment for a period of time, you know. But then when you, you, you realize that the sports car or the, the new wardrobe or the vacation or the whatever people do to try to make the feeling go, and the novelty of that, that, that thing outside of us wears off because we're trying to re-identify with our environment. And that goes away. The next thing that people do is they look for some immediate change. And so they take a drug. They drink something, they, they gamble, they watch pornography, and the event outside of them changes their internal chemistry. And the moment they notice that the pain or the emptiness goes away, the moment they feel differently, they look to see what caused it. And this is when the attachment begins. Here's the problem though. The rush of chemical change that takes place, the pleasure centers in the brain, there's a huge release of the pleasure chemicals and the, the release, the intensity of those release of those chemicals begins to desensitize the receptor sites in the brain. So as the brain chemicals uh, uh, are re released and the receptor sites become desensitized, the next time you gamble, the next time you take the drug, the next time you shop, you need a little bit more the next time. So then what happens is the pleasure centers start to get re recalibrated to a higher and higher level. So you're always going to need more to make that feeling go away. Sounds like an addiction to me. And so people get lost because then without the dependency on that external substance, the body which has become the mind is, is craving its relief. And so an addiction really is when the body is the mind. So you may say with your conscious mind, I want to give up drinking, I want to give up pornography, I want to give up gaming, I want to give up over shopping, I want to give it up consciously. But the body has been conditioned from the past subconsciously. And so now the body's the mind. Now, no one's told people that true change can happen within them. And so then, when people start to realize that there's a gap between the external world and how they present themselves to the world and their, their attention on the outer world and their attention on their inner world and how they really feel. And if they're spending the majority of their time looking outside of them for change and they don't want to look at this feeling, all they want to do is make that feeling go away, they're going to wind up in trouble. So true change is when you start looking within and you become conscious of your unconscious thoughts. In neuroscience it's called metacognition. You become aware of your habits and your unconscious behaviors. And you look at those emotions that are connected to past experiences and allow yourself to observe them. So then think about this. If 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old are those program states, the moment you're observing how you think, how you act, and how you feel, it means you're no longer the program. You're now a consciousness observing the program and you're beginning to objectify your subjective self. You are seeing yourself through the eyes of someone else. 
Turns out that the size of the frontal lobe, the crowning achievement of the human being, 40% of our entire brain, that's what separates us from all other species. It's the boss, it's the CEO, it's the conscience, it's the creative center. It's what speculates possibilities, it's what learns from its mistakes, it's what has intention, attention, it regulates and controls behaviors and emotional reactions. When your forebrain begins to turn on, when that begins to happen, you are now beginning to become the executive in your life. You're starting to gain more control over your life. If you're living primarily as the body-mind, then the hindbrain is looking for some chemical relief. So by the mere fact that you can begin to observe who you're being, means you could modify who you are to do a better job in life. So then, going from the old self to the new self, I call that crossing the river of change. Because the moment, the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. And the moment you're not going to think the same way, make the same choice that leads to the same behavior, that creates the same experience, that produces the same emotion, you are not going to feel like yourself. It's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. There's going to be a certain amount of uncertainty. You are going to feel the state of unpredictability. And that's the moment you step into the river of change. And the moment you step into the river of change, you're, then that discomfort means you're in the unknown. And so the body, which has been conditioned to the mind, who's been living in the past, would rather hold on to the guilt, because at least it's familiar. They'd rather hold on to their own emptiness and unworthiness than not feel that, because that's, that's the unknown. So people cling to the familiar, and it transcends rationality. So then, the moment you step into that river and the body has become the mind, the body starts sending signals back to the brain because it wants to return back to the familiar self. And this is when we start to hear all the chatter, the sub-vocalizations, you're not good enough, you're too much like your mother, it's your ex-husband's fault, start tomorrow, this doesn't feel good, what's wrong with me, I want to kill myself. That's the body saying, I'd rather, I don't want to go in the unknown, I don't trust the unknown, I'd rather hold on to this. Now, going from that old self to the new self, is the biological, the neurological, the chemical, the hormonal, the genetic death of the old self. And most people, they step out into that unknown and it feels so uncomfortable, they can't predict it, they return back to the known. People say to me, well, I can't, I can't predict my future. And I always say to them, well, the best way to predict your future is to create it, not from the known, but from the unknown. And that void, that unknown, is the perfect place to create from. Now, why is this dangerous? Because when you're living in survival 70% of the time, there's better chances in survival from running from the unknown than embracing the unknown, right? If there's a predator out there, you hear something around the corner and you can't see it, that's an unknown, you're gonna run. You're not gonna go, and it's not a time to trust. It's not a time to open your heart. It's not a time to communicate. Here, kitty, kitty, it's not a time to do that. It's time to run. You'll never trust the unknown in that state. So if people are living by these emotional states of survival, they're never going to want to step out into the unknown because they can't predict the future. So they'd rather hold on to what they have. It turns out that those emotions of stress are highly addictive. They give us a rush of adrenaline, rush of energy. And so people use the problems and conditions in their lives to reaffirm their addiction to that emotion so they can remember who they are as a somebody. So then, if your thoughts can turn on the stress response, and those stress chemicals are addictive, then we become addicted to our own thoughts. So then stepping out into that unknown is where, the, where true greatness happens, because that's where the person begins to say, what thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain? What behaviors will I want to demonstrate in my new life? Can I rehearse them in my mind? And the mere process of mental rehearsal, this is neuroscience now, begins to install the circuits in your brain to look like the experience has already occurred. You're priming your brain into the map of the future instead of the record of the past. And then the true, true person who's in the process of transformation will say, can I teach my body emotionally what that future is going to be like? Can I begin to embrace the joy of my new life? And their body as their unconscious mind begins to believe it's in the future instead of in the past. Now, that process is not an overnight process. We don't jump from the old self to the new self. 
it requires that continuous process of changing our biology. But I can tell you in observing people who have healed themselves of very serious health conditions, who've healed themselves of some pretty difficult scars and from the past, who've overcome addictions, who've created new opportunities and new uh, jobs and new uh, relationships and a new life, had to cross that river. And that is when they're literally, by a lot, from a biological standpoint, a new personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. And your personality is made of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So the present personality who's sitting here today has created the present personal reality called their life. Which means then, if you want to create a new personal reality, you got to change your personality. And that means you got to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. Look at your unconscious habits and behaviors, what you say, what you do, and become conscious of it. And change them. And look at the emotions that have kept you anchored to the past and decide if those emotions belong in your future. I think the biggest problem is that most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. So then as we begin to demystify this, the person starts to say, oh my God, the disease that I have is because it's connected to this personality. Is it possible that if I change my personality, just like a person with a multiple personality disorder, who has an allergy to nylon stockings in one personality and, and type 1 diabetes in another, is it possible that if I change my personality, that the disease exists in the old personality and I'm literally someone else, is it possible then from a biological standpoint that they're healed and changed? So to answer the question, it's difficult because we're breaking out of a biological mold. It's difficult because most people don't know that they have within their reach all the tools to do it because they have, number three, been conditioned on some level to believe that the new hairstyle or the new uh, type of beer they're going to drink or the sports car or whatever it is, is going to change their state. And that's, that's the hypnosis. And when I wrote the placebo, uh, You Are the Placebo, uh, the biggest thing that I walked away with after writing that book was how, how hypnotized and programmed we really are. And, that's bothered me ever since I wrote the book because people watch things in their external environment and they, they, they accept, believe, and surrender to those, those, that information without any analysis and they're programmed. And so when you and I start waking up and say no to those programs and we start to think that we're maybe more, a little bit more unlimited than we're given credit for and it's not driven for profits or self-interest but when people start to wake up and say, Hey, you know, I healed myself of this condition. I healed myself of Parkinson's. I healed myself of lupus. I healed myself of cancer. I've healed myself of rheumatoid arthritis. I've healed myself of chronic pain. I healed myself of food allergies. Hey, yeah, I was abused as a child. Yeah, that's right. I was, I was beat, beat up by a violent father, and I lived in vulnerability and fear for the last 25 years. But that fear has signaled the wrong gene, and I developed this genetic condition. The doctor said I had no way of healing. But when I overcame that fear and I broke out of it, I started to signal new genes in new ways, and that disease doesn't exist. Let me tell you, if you listen to that woman's story, and you listen to all the trials that she had gone through, and how she overcame herself, and she reached a place of such wholeness and self-satisfaction that she could care less if she had the disease, and that's the moment it went away, and you listen to that story, it's going to give you permission on some level that it's possible for you to do the same. You see someone dance the salsa well, you'll dance the salsa better. You see someone hit a golf ball like Rory, you'll hit a golf ball better. You see someone lead with love and compassion in their life, you will lead with love and compassion in your life. You see someone stand on a stage in front of 500 people and talk about how they overcame their cancer after their husband committed suicide and the three years that it took her to do it you will be inspired that it's possible for you. So then it has to start with a new consciousness and that, that it's going to come from common people doing the uncommon. And that's where my passion is.